Hello, everyone. Today is December, what's my computer say? December 19th, 2018. I hope everybody is having a beautiful week. We've had a couple nice days here in Pennsylvania. I mean, it's been cold. Uh, there hasn't been any snow, but it's been somewhat sunny, just a few clouds. So I guess it's okay. I prefer Florida weather, but it uh, hasn't been so bad, I guess, this week. Um, we got Shelly and Carrie and Dana and Laura, Stephanie, Kelly, Jasmine, Joyce. Shelly, everybody's tuning in, getting in nice and early. I really appreciate that. Just been continuing. As you can see, I'm still here in Pennsylvania. I anticipate here probably being here, I'm guess, going to guess for another month, maybe. Um, taking care of things with my dad, just kind of us hanging out. Um, hello, Dan, what's going on? Uh, we went to the Olive Garden today, which was good. And uh, I, I must, you know, the funny thing is that I must be like an old person or something because I could eat at the Olive Garden all the time. <laughs> I know Olive Garden is generally seen as a place where like old people eat because they give you lots of free bread and free salad, et cetera, et cetera. I could eat there all the time. In fact, I will tell you that when I go playing disc golf tournaments, that's usually where I eat when I'm on the road. So there you go. And what's up, Cheryl and Krissa? And yeah, you finally get a chance to, uh, to watch live. Great, Krissa. That's good to hear. Uh, Carrie says it was almost 60 here in Missouri today. Yeah, that's nice. Joey and Ann, welcome, everybody. Thanks for everybody who is tuning in. Um, you, know, the, you know, my attitude about Pennsylvania weather, really, uh, that I don't live here anymore, is that if it's going to be cold, I just wish it was would snow. These days where it's like 30 degrees and there's no snow, there's no leaves on the trees, but you can see the grass and it's like overcast. I mean, the, the day is as gray as the earth gets. Those are the days that I don't miss in Pennsylvania, and there are many of them, many of them. So my attitude is always, if I'm going to be here and it's going to be cold, it should snow all the time. Let's just see the snow. Let's make it a little um, difficult to drive. Of course, the snow is beautiful. I can't argue with that. But there are just too many gold, cold, gray days in Pennsylvania for my liking. Uh, Jackie, what's going on? Hello, Pamela. Um, Holly, what's going on? Thanks for everybody for tuning in. I'm wondering if everybody has their Christmas shopping done. Got less than a week. Might be a good time to start thinking about it. No offense. So, um, of course, next Monday is Christmas Eve. Next Tuesday is Christmas. Um, my plans, my dad and my plans are to go to my Uncle Ron's, which is my, my mother's brother's place for Christmas Eve, and then we are going to go to my brother Michael's for Christmas Day. So I'm looking really uh, looking forward to it. Um, Carrie says, I love Olive Garden. Well, there you go, Carrie. Hello, Holly and Pamela, Dee Dee. What's going on, Dee Dee? Thanks for tuning in. Um, Carrie says, winter doesn't officially start until Friday. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Uh, I know what that's what the calendar says. I get it. Um, and Jack says, yes, she did finish her, her uh, shopping today. Jamie hasn't finished her shopping. Kelly, Shelly hasn't finished her shopping. Stephanie hasn't finished her shopping. You, you ladies better get it together. Um, and then Carrie says she has one or two things left to get, and then you're done. Okay, great. Um, I want to remind all of you that this show is moving. It's going to be moving to YouTube the first Wednesday of 2019, which is January 2nd, the day after New Year's. So that's going to be a new experience. Um, I'm sure there are going to be some growing pains with that. It's probably not going to go as smoothly as I liked, but that's where the show is going to be. I'm doing this. Hello, Jennifer. Um, I'm doing this because to watch this show right now, you have to have a Facebook account. And um, a lot of people don't have Facebook accounts. Many don't. Well, I, and I shouldn't take that for granted. Whereas on YouTube, anybody can watch. You don't have to have a 
YouTube account to watch. So that's why uh, I'm switching it up. We'll see how it goes because as you know, what's going on, Mike? Um, as you know, this show ends up going on to YouTube anyway. So I'm kind of just cutting out the middleman, I guess you might say. Facebook is excellent for marketing, no doubt about it, for the show, for the show, for the episodes, for Patreon and, and everything else, the books. It's great for that. But I think for video, um, there's a reason there's Facebook over here and YouTube over here. And I just see so many more people doing things on uh, YouTube as far as video than on Facebook that I think I have to make the change to. And I think it will get more viewers. What's up, Shaney? Hello, Cherie. How are you doing? Good to see you in here, Cherie. Uh, Carrie says, now I got to learn how to do the whole YouTube live thing. Teaching an old, not do new, uh, old dog new tricks. Uh, Carrie, uh, I think for all of us, it's going to be probably a little rough to sh start because I don't think that um, I'm, I'm going to do some practicing, but really I won't be able to see how it really, really works until we actually do a real live show. And that's no different than when this show started uh, back in October of 2017. Same thing. I had no idea how it was going to go. No idea. No idea. So there's that. Um, Shelly, I hope so. I hope there is some great growth with it. I, I, I hope so too. So I want to remind you that. I'm going to keep reminding everybody of that so nobody gets confused and goes to YouTube or goes to Facebook here on January 2nd. They're like, well, I thought there was going to be a show tonight. And then they forget that it's on YouTube. I'm going to continue to remind all of you uh, until that day. Um, I want to talk about the poll from the Stephen Adams episode, which of course was this past Friday, it was very close. The poll ended up being very close, um, but um, the question was, why do you think that Stephen didn't mention who was with him in the truck when the girlfriend called him the day that he disappeared? Uh, the number one choice barely was because he didn't think it was important which is an interesting number one choice, I have to say. And then the number two choice, a uh, very close second, which is also, some, which is something we did talk about, is that the call got cut short because he was in an area that didn't have very good cell phone service. It's very interesting that those are the two, um, two most popular choices. I can tell you, neither of those would have been my choice. I have to be honest with you. I happen to believe that the, the reason he didn't tell her is because he didn't want her to know. That's my person. I Now that you've listened to the episode, you've heard the interview with Deanie, his mother, you know just about as much as I do. And it's interesting how we can listen to the same interview. I conduct it. You listen to it. And we come up with uh, different conclusions. And that's what I love about uh, doing Unfound This Way where – I don't tell you what to think, okay? I really, really enjoy not trying to push certain ideas down your throat. You can hear the facts. You, you know about a lot of other missing persons cases, and you can judge it for yourself. And I think that's what's, that one of the most fascinating things about Unfound is that how often you, the listeners, have a different spin on something than I do. I find it fascinating, and I, and I support it. Michelle, what's going on? Um, Dana, the Facebook reminder is how I remember to watch. Well, Dana, you, uh, I'll start setting up YouTube reminders as we get closer to January 2nd. So don't worry about it. Um, Cherie says she was in the minority on the poll again. Me too. Um, um, okay, okay. All right, Cherie. Uh, Stephanie, what's going on? Carrie says, I think the call dropped before he could go on. And AT tell, I know, okay, cell phone blows, Oklahoma cell signal blows. Katrina, wave right back at you, Katrina. Tree says she loves the polls. And Sean, what's going on? Good to see you tonight, Sean. Thanks for tuning in. So there's the poll. And then lastly, I wanted to put, I just, once again, so many things going on here. Um, you know, and while I'm in Pennsylvania, I really haven't been able to work on the books any. 
just not as much time up here as I'm sure you understand, but I am uh, getting these episodes done. And there's going to be an episode this Friday, and there's going to be a new episode next Friday. So I'm really excited about that. But I posted that map for the Stephen Adams episode a little late, and I apologize for that. I should have gotten that out the day the episode came out because when Deanie and I start talking about the, you know, where he was driving and where he was going and where she lived, it's hard to explain maps on an audio show. And I meant to get that map out earlier. Hopefully posting that map in both the, the group and on the page, that helps some of you better understand what Deanie was trying to say. I hope so. Um, Michelle says, hi, Ed, I've been ill. Not even on much, but I'm back. Michelle, I've seen some of your posts, so I kind of knew that. I hope you're feeling much better, okay? I want you to know that I've seen um, what's kind of what's been going on, and uh, so no problem at all. Marcus, way to, uh, way to tune in tonight. Good to see you. Good to see you. Lou, you're a little late, Lou. Not a lot late. Um, Sean, first time listening. Well, Sean, I thank you. I, I really appreciate making uh, time. Uh, this one's the night. Thank you. So those are some things. Uh, reminder about YouTube. Everybody have the, does everybody have the shopping done? Um, just a poll about the Stephen Adams episode, and then the map that is now posted uh, on the group, in the group, and on the page, so you can look at it um, at uh, your leisure. If you got a little confused when Deanie was trying to talk about the um the direction that Stephen would have been driving and where she lives uh that was a significant part of that interview by the way i have a slippery rock i don't know if everybody's familiar with this school but slippery rock i got a slippery rock athletics shirt on tonight um i did not get this is a university it's very close to where my parents live i did not go there actually my dad went there way back in the 1950s and so He's given me several, several slipper rock shirts and things over the years. And um, so I wear them, but I did not go to school here. I went to a, a school called Grove City, which is coincidentally very close to Slipper Rock. It's like on the other side of Slipper Rock from where we live. They're only separated by about seven miles or something like that. Um, Lou says, Facebook has reset all the notifications for groups to highlight. So if people want to see all of your posts, they need to update their notification settings. I've done that, so I won't be late next time. I didn't know anything about that, Lou. I have to admit it. I, I didn't know that. And Stormy, good to see you tonight. So um, if anybody has any questions, I did not get any questions, at least to my knowledge, before this um, show started tonight. So if you have any questions about anything, you know, um, doesn't have to be on true crime, just stuff that's going on, please ask me because I've come to this show tonight without any questions. So right now, I'm just going to go right into the news, some things that I want to discuss. And uh, if you have to pop in, if you pop in with a question that uh, doesn't have to pertain with what I'm talking about, totally fine. You can do that and we can switch things up a little bit. The first thing I want to talk about is the 48 Hours episode from Saturday night, and that had to deal with Jody Husentrude. I realize that this isn't a case that I've covered on Unfound. Um, we kind of, I, I guess we did cover it, but not in the way we usually do things on Unfound. But in uh, May of 2017, I had Carolyn Lowe on the show. And she has been following Jody's uh, disappearance for many, many years. And she is one of the main people at findjody.com. And in fact, she was interviewed for the 48 Hours episode that was on Saturday night. And I want you to know I linked to the episode that you can watch it in its entirety online in both the group and on the page if you would like to do that. It's a full episode. It's like 40-some minutes long. And it covers... The disappearance of Jody Husentrude. She disappeared in June of 1995 from Mason City, Iowa. A fairly well-known disappearance. Now, I will have you know 
that I did cover that disappearance on the other podcast I used to do before I started Unfound. The other one, the name of which I never used the name of it, in which I had a co-host. We did cover it on there, but in what you would call real Unfound terms, uh, the, the, the closest we've done, done with that is when I had Caroline Lowe on the program, but it wasn't um, it wasn't somebody in Jody's family or somebody like something like this. Uh, Pamela, we're going to get to this week's story. Don't you worry about that. We're going to get to that. Um, and I'm going to talk about Kelsey Baruth too, Shelly, here in, in a bit. But we're going to talk about Jody here for a while because I think this is fairly important. I did, as you know, by this time, I don't listen to hardly any other true crime podcasts in Florida, I don't have TV, I don't have cable, I don't have dish, I don't have anything like that. It helps me get more work done. But I did, and I made it a point to watch this 48 Hours episode <clears throat> on Saturday night. And I have to tell you, I learned some things about Jody's disappearance that I had not heard before. And I, I think they're significant, although... I still have my doubts about, you know, the main theory regarding what happened to her. So there as you go. There. Um, probably the biggest thing that came out of that, that ep the episode on Saturday night was that that Miata, we remember, Jody came out of her place. She was late to work. She was carrying a bunch of stuff. She gets close to her car. Somebody or some buddies... Uh, attack her, stuff strewn all over the parking lot, and her car was a Miata. What turns out, for some reason, and I want you to know that I've had a couple back and forth messages with Caroline since Saturday, but I've not had a chance to talk to her in depth about any of these things. I just pointed out some things to her. I hope to talk to her soon. Uh, we'll see if I can talk about anything we talk about. We'll just have to see. But I was shocked to learn that the car that was hers was not in her name. The title for that car was not in her name. It was in some other, it was in a man's name, but it wasn't John Van Sice, the guy that was, that has played a prominent part in Jody's disappearance in day one because he knew her well and there are people who think that he may be the one that caused her to disappear, and he was talked about extensively on the 48 Hours episode. Um, in fact, they tried to interview him, he, and he wouldn't talk to anybody. Um, I was really shocked to learn that that car was not in her name. It seems, right at this second, that somebody bought that car for her and it was some guy and I forget the guy's name and I'd have to go back, but it was some older guy just like John Van Sice was an older guy. And this is something that, you know, I was surprised, but then given how I think about disappearances, I shouldn't be surprised because here is something that I often say, and this is not to be sexist or anything else. OK, it's just I think what I've learned from my experience is that if you have a young woman who's attractive, has a lot of good things going on in her life, there are going to be many men of a variety of ages who are trying to get her attention. That's just the way life is. OK, that's just the way it is. Um, I've, uh, you know. I've seen it firsthand, me maybe being interested in some women in my life and then knowing that other men are interested in this woman or I've had women who are friends of mine and I, you know, I've seen how many men are interested in them. I've seen it from all angles. So it shouldn't surprise me that Jody Husentrut, who was attractive, uh, intelligent, was well known because of her being on TV. She was outgoing, golfing, and everything else. That here was John Van Sice trying to get her attention, naming his boat after her. But then she has this car who, that's in some guy's name, and it seems possibly that this guy might have bought this car for her. 
And this is what is so tough to determine. I would throw like like Jen, Jennifer Kessie's disappearance is the same thing. I think there were a multiple, uh, multitude of men who were interested in her. And I think it's one of those men who caused her to disappear. Same way with Jody Husentrude. I think that's what happened. And I'm not willing to go out uh, and say that it was necessarily John Van Sice. All it proves to me is that there were probably more guys than John Van Sice and the guy who bought the car for her who were probably also interested in her. And it could be that one of these other guys found out about this guy getting her this car and got jealous. Very, very possible. And uh, there is a lot of precedent in, like, for example, murders of women. And those murders are eventually solved where this was the case. Guy gets... Um, jealous about some other guy, stalks the woman, kills her. Very common scenario. And so, although on one hand I was surprised about the car, I think I was surprised because I never heard it before, given that I've followed that case so much. But then on the other hand, when I compare that fact to a lot of things, I know a lot of facts about other disappearances, other unsolved murders or solved murders, then it's not so crazy then it's not so crazy. And it opens up uh, a wide array of possibilities. And I have to tell you, I'm not sure that Caroline Lowe knew that fact or not. Um, that's still unclear to me. And I really don't know how many people in the public knew about this car. I did not. I did not. Okay, so that was very, very uh, significant to me. Big big red flag. What also means is, and the thing is, that Miata that she got in, you know, 19, you know, you look at it now, and it's like, it's like a 1985 Miata. Well, back at the time, a lot of people wanted those cars. I'm not into that type of car, but a lot of people did. And she didn't have it that long. And so can there be some um, relationship between her getting this car it being in some other guy's name, and then her disappearing shortly after that. I think that that's something that uh, is important. I'm going to guess that the cops have looked into that and it hasn't led them anywhere, which I don't know what that means. I'm sure they've looked into it, but obviously it hasn't gone anywhere. And I wish I could remember the guy's name. I'm going to have to. I didn't write it in my notes. I'm going to have to go back and... Uh, listen to that part or watch that part of the episode again. And in fact, I want to talk to Caroline about that because they covered it very, very quickly. And I think that that is something I would like to know a lot more about. Okay, so that was something that um, that was something that really jumped off the, the page or the screen to me on Saturday night. Um, um, what's story, Stormy? I'm going to read out. Because of Unfound, people are still learning about my brother in his case. I just got a message from someone who started listening to Unfound and heard about my brother. Even though it's been a while since I've been on Unfound, people are getting back, <clears throat> going back far to listen. I hope this is an encouragement for you, Ed. What you do is great. Stormy, you know how I uh, feel about you and your mother and your brother's case. Deeply, deeply. Uh, interested in it. I, of course, want it resolved today, tomorrow at the latest. Um, and I, I hope that I've helped. And of course, with you, Stormy, and some other things that have gone on behind the scenes, um, you know, we're just trying to do as much as we can, you know, trying to give you as much help as I can. And I deeply, deeply appreciate the kind words. Thank you, Stormy. Thank you. Um, Paula says, I went back and listened to all the episodes once I discovered Unfound. Thank you, Paula. Angie, what's going on? Um, Carrie asks, have they checked into who was paying her rent and such? Not bad-mouthing her. Just curious, could there have been a third guy yet? Uh, Carrie, I'm inclined to believe there are probably more than that. Um, the angle that I've concentrated on personally, and this is well before I ever started Unfound, 
And I've been a part of the forum at findjody.com for just about as long as that website has existed. Uh, I've always looked at the angle that Jody had some sort of stalker, somebody who saw her on TV and started stalking her, following her because she was a local celebrity. That's always been my belief. Unfortunately, there's never been a lot of talk on any show or elsewhere about how much the police really looked into it. I'm sure she got fan mail. Of course, at that time, 95, email was just starting. I'm sure she got a bunch of fan mail. We haven't heard a lot about that. Were there any creepy fan mail letters? We don't know. The public doesn't know. But that's always been the angle that I've concentrated on. But I'm, I'm open-minded to anything uh, right now. So there's surely even more than a third guy. There might be a fourth and fifth guy. Christina, Susie, thanks for tuning in. Stormy, you're welcome. So there's that. The other thing uh, that caught my eye was that it was weird seeing they showed the video that was taken after she disappeared. Somebody went in and took a video of the inside of the apartment. Once again, this is something that I will have to look get at again more closely. Obviously, the police went through it, didn't see anything weird. What I was looking for, but it doesn't, as far as I can remember, doesn't show it in the video, is I was looking at the toilet seat. I know that seems really, really strange. But at some point, some, a piece of information was put out there that the toilet seat in Jody's apartment was up instead of down when they went in there. Uh, I think that's on Web Sleuths. I think that you'll find that at a variety of different places. I was looking for that. Unfortunately, they did video the bathroom, but you can't see the toilet. I would like to see that because if the seat was up, you could draw the, to the, come to the conclusion that a man was in there that night with Jody. You could. But it's just a rumor right now, and that video doesn't show it. But I was watching that video and trying to see that, but it doesn't show it. Uh, I'm, but I'm not sure if there's anything incriminating or suspicious on the video or not. Uh, it, the video is, of course, taken with a 1995 video camera, not you know a, a technology of the time. It's not that clear. Uh, once again, if you watch... The episode, and I think they have it posted on the 48 Hours website, you can go and watch it for yourself. Karen, uh, Karen, uh, Stormy's Brothers episode is Brandon Williams, and we did that episode um, the first half earlier in 2017. Karen, that's how far you'll have to go back to find that episode. Alexis, what's going on? Thanks. Uh, Thanks uh, for tuning in. Jasmine, you heard about the toilet seat too? Right. Piece of information that's interesting, however, in that uh, 48 hours episode, they didn't talk about it. There was no corroboration, nothing. Yes, yeah, so the toilet seat would being up would certainly be odd for a single girl's apartment, Carrie. Exactly, exactly. So there's that, the video. Other uh, something else. John Van Sice, once again, this is something that I didn't know Maybe it's out in the public and I just missed it. John Van Sice had some drinking issues to the point that I think that he got caught drinking and driving at least once. Um, some people are going could probably draw a conclusion that place. Maybe he was mad about her. Maybe he was mad about the car that she got from somebody else, drunk himself into a stupor, kind of went over there, sloppy drunk confronted her and something happened. That is certainly going to come up now. I think anybody who's watched the 48 Hours episode is going to hear that and that's what they're going to think. Makes perfect sense. But I had not heard that before. That just shows you how you can go 23 years, even in a case as well known as Jody's and it's, it's been dissected over and over and over. And you still find out new things, at least from the public standpoint, 23 years later. Um, Stephanie said, asked me, what wasn't Jody about to move out? I don't, uh, they didn't mention that in the episode. Not that I remember Stephanie and I've never heard that. 
So I don't know. I don't know, Stephanie. So there's the John Van Sice's drinking issues. And like I said, they tried to interview him toward the end of the, the program on Saturday night. He lives in Arizona now. He didn't want to have anything to do with him. Didn't, didn't want us. Even though way back in 1995, he couldn't shut up. These days, exactly the opposite. <laughs> so you can take that for what it's worth. You should know that um, there is a woman who they interviewed for the 48 Hours episode who was a friend of John Van Sice's who absolutely claims there's no way he would have ever harmed Jody in any way. And in fact, this woman is kind of giving John Van Sice an alibi, saying that she ended up meeting up with him. They used to meet up every morning to go walking at like 6 in the morning, and she claims that he was there right on time that morning, right at 6 a.m., and it would have been roughly an hour and a half before that that Jody disappeared. I don't know what to think of that. I got the impression about this woman that she would say anything. It seemed to me that maybe there was a little bit more going on than just a friendship between the two of them. Maybe at the time, I don't know. Now, I don't know. But I got the impression almost that she would have said anything to defend him. So you can watch it. You can judge it for yourself. Alexis, uh, was anybody ever to find this episode about Jody online? Um, the 48 hours episode I linked to in the group, in the unfound podcast discussion group, Alexis, if you go there and scroll down, you will show, uh, you will see a link to the episode 48 hours episode that you can watch in its entirety. Uh, Caroline Lowe sent me that, and I deeply thank her for that. Um, Carrie, I don't know anything about a shoe being found on the passenger side instead of the driver's side. I, that is not something that I'm familiar with either. Cheryl, how are you tonight? Good to see you. Thanks for joining in. Uh, half hour late, no big deal. We still got a lot to talk about. Um, and then finally... In watching that episode, if you haven't watched it yet, I urge you to watch it. I urge you to, because I think that um, not only is that a case that's still unsolved, but I think you can learn a lot from that case and what has gone on the last 23 years that may help you as you look at other missing persons cases and trying to draw comparisons. But this is also a good example of why I don't talk to detectives who are working um, why I don't interview de detectives on cases that unfound covers. You listen to that. You watch the Mason City Police Chief. Now, granted, he was not on the job. I don't know. He might have even been in high school when Jody disappeared, for all I know, back in 1995. But he didn't want to tell 48 Hours anything. Anything. And, in fact, I would go as far to say it was just a big waste of time that they even talked to him. If anybody wants an example of why I don't talk to detectives, yes, I'm friend with Detective Kenneth Maines. Um, I've talked to some private investigators, absolutely. But actually, police officers who are currently working uh, a missing persons case that I may cover for Unfound, it's just a big waste of time in my point, from my standpoint. I just, uh, I don't want to talk to anybody who's not going to tell me anything, okay? It's just the way it is. My, my job is to get information out there, not to have conversations with people for 20 minutes and us not know any more than we did before. That's just a big waste of time for everybody. You, me, the police officer, that's why I don't do it. Um, so when you get to, if you watch it, you get to the end, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So that was the Jody Hughes and Trout uh, episode of 48 Hours. Um, so I, I, you should watch it. Like I said, there's a link to it. You should definitely check it out. Uh, I thought the 48 hours did a pretty good job. Uh, Jody Houston Truth's case is one you probably could devote a couple hours on a TV show to at least with all the intricacies of it. Uh, they did talk about Tony Jackson in there, which is a lead that Caroline herself first developed of some things that she knew but i have to tell you the further and further we get away from the day that jody disappeared the less and less i think he had anything to do with it 
Uh, they did give it fair amount of time. They did give jo Tony Jackson a fair amount of time on the 48 hours episode. It just seems like a stretch to me. I'm not saying he's not a bad guy. He is. And he lived close to Jody. But on the other hand, I'm sure if we went back to 1995, I'm sure if we could find quite a few rapists who lived within 10 blocks of Jody as well. So, you know, what does that mean? I just don't know. Carrie says the still shots looked like passenger side of the car, which in a day of not having key fobs, personally, I wouldn't have unlocked passenger side door, just driver side and dump stuff in passenger side when I got in the car. That would make me almost think someone may have been with her as well. I don't know, Carrie. I'll have to look, take a look at that. That's not something. Um, I don't know. I, I, I just uh, don't know what to think about that. So all I remember is everything was strewn. Uh, her hair dryer, uh, the key I remember was broken off in the lock of the car, and I believe that everything was on one side of the car. So, but I could be wrong. So there was Jody Who's a True. I want to talk about it. Uh, it's a case I've been following for years and years, and um, it's a case I will continue to follow if there's any new information. I hope to be talking to Caroline Lowe, and depending on what we talk about and how private it is or public and everything, I will try to come back to you with some updates because I certainly want to talk to her about the ownership of Jody's car and see if we can maybe flesh out some more understanding regarding that because the 48 Hours episode went by it very, very fast. Very, very fast. So. There's that. Okay. Jody Houston Truth. Let's move on to something else. Jamie Kloss. Of course, this is the girl who disappeared. Her mother and father were shot uh, to death. The father was lying just within a few feet of the front door. The mother was found elsewhere in the house, shot to death. Her mother had made the 911 call while Jamie is still missing. Um, I, I know that a couple people this past week have um, asked me about, I haven't seen any new updates. And my general attitude is that the longer this case goes um, unresolved, unsolved, she's not, her body's not found or anything, the longer it goes, the more I think that somebody she knew that Jamie knew did it, okay? That's my, that's how I read this. Um, and of course, the most important part is that it doesn't seem like there is anybody else missing in that area. So it's hard to believe a situation where some guy had the hots for her and they decided they were going to run off and the guy comes over, kills her parents and they run off because there's no missing persons report for any guy in that area, whether the guy is 18 or 40 or 65. So that scenario looks unlikely. So either we have a situation where it was a, a guy or ma man or men, taking for granted, that went to the house, took her, and either they um, did something like with, you know, Laura Bible and Ashley Freeman, where they took her for a few days and did this and did that and then murder her. Or this could be an Ariel Castro, Castro situation where some guy, some man or men, went and got her and all these weeks later, she is still being um, caged, locked up somewhere. I think that those are the two most likely scenarios. But I still say that the longer this, this goes, the more likely it's going to be you're going to find out that this was some guy who knew her. Um, whether they met over the internet or it was somebody, some guy that was following her around, maybe it introduced himself to her at some time, something like that. I wouldn't even rule out that it could have been one of her teachers, given all the news we hear about that these days. But this was not some stranger who went to that house and broke in, killed the parents, and took Jamie away. It was not a stranger. Pretty sure. So could she, you know, now of course, 
The other thing that is out there is that, you know, could she have pulled this off herself? Possible, not probable, but possible. Given, you know, did she go outside with a gun, you know, fake it and then come, you know, and do something and make it look? She could have done that. I think that's very improbable, though. Pretty, pretty, pretty improbable. Um, uh, Carrie says, is the 911 tape released yet on Jamie's case? I think that it was out at one time, Carrie. I, I don't know. I, I, I've heard so much about it. I think my mind is telling me that I did hear it, but it's possible that I didn't. I just know that there's been a lot of talk about it. And the talk about it, I think, has been fair. Um precise, you know, fairly descriptive. So a lot of people maybe think that they've heard it, but haven't. Um, Cherie says, I think it's exactly like the Bible Freeman case. Cherie, I, I have to agree with you. Sarah, what's going on? Good to see you, Sarah. And Sarah, thank you uh, for posting in the group every day. Uh, I've seen the very nice things you said about me and Unfound and the listeners. Uh, Sarah, I can't thank you enough. Uh, I'm hoping that things are going in a very positive direction in Alyssa's case. And I hope that you will all keep us all updated as things continue. Thank you very much. And you're free to post uh, in the group anytime you want. Um, Shelly says, I agree with the Bible Freeman scenario. This was targeted for sure. It was someone that knew them all. Right. Uh, Shaney says, I don't think that Jamie Kloss did it. Very improbable. Uh, but not impossible. Um, Carrie says, I'm interested in hearing the 911 call. Am I on the fence if mom or Jamie made the call? My understanding is that it was the mother that made the call, Carrie, but once again, I'm not sure if I heard it or not. Uh, the, the, the press, the police have said that the mother made the call. I don't know. Um, Sarah, Sarah, thank you. You keep us updated. I deeply appreciate that. Thank you. All right, let's move on to something else. And being that somebody already asked me about this, uh, Kelsey Barrath, B-E-R-R-T-H. Of course, this is this woman who is a flight instructor who disappeared on Thanksgiving Day after dropping off her son to his father's, her fiance. So I'm guessing that they had a, a child together. They were engaged to get married. She was dropping the child off with him, and she was going to be going, uh, I guess, to her family's for Thanksgiving. I'm not sure. Once again, I'm not an expert on the case. But uh, I'm just a little confused about what the plans exactly were supposed to be for Thanksgiving. You know, Thanksgiving is a time you're supposed to spend with family. Why was she dropping off their child to her, their child to him, and then she was going to go on her own. I'm not sure if that totally makes sense to me. And of course, the the predictable thing is now that um, the police are now searching the the piece of land that the fiance lives on. Now, the tough part about it, he lives on 35 acres. Must be nice. Uh, his name is Patrick Frazy. F R A. Z E E. And, but now, you know, the police have gone to Idaho trying to track the phone down. They've gone everywhere else. And they've now they've circled the whole way back to looking at the fiance again, looking at his uh, property and seeing if his story uh, makes sense or doesn't make any sense. Because he was the last person we know to have seen her. Um, Many, uh, not many, some people have come to Patrick's defense saying that he's a gentle soul that who would never have hurt Kelsey. Well, you know, I don't know if that means anything. Um, I would, I think I would have a better handle on this disappearance if I knew what Kelsey's plans were for that day. Because once again, it seems weird to me on Thanksgiving, she's dropping the, 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 the child off with the fiance, Patrick, and then she was going to go do something. But then on top of that, 
Nobody even filed a police uh, a missing persons report for 10 days. I don't know. I don't I don't know what the th and you know I guess her car isn't missing only she is missing. You know in her phone or purse. So I would feel much better about this and better have a better handle on it. I'd like to know more about what were the plans were for Thanksgiving. And if you know the plans don't make any sense to me or you know people start fumbling around like Patrick starts fumbling around about what the actual plans were. I mean, was she were she and he and the child not going to spend Thanksgiving together? Or was they not going to go over to her parents or his parents or something? And then once again, I have to say this again. Missing persons report wasn't filed for 10 days. 10 days. I don't know. Just seems, um, I don't know. Um, Lou says, I've been following, they were not engaged. So all this word about them being, him being the fiance is not true, Lou? Is that what you're saying? They keep referring to him as the fiance. Uh, I can only go by what the media says, but you, that may be right. Uh, Shaney says, my mom lives where her phone last pinged up in Idaho. Okay. Uh, Lou says, they were not really together. Well, if that's the case, Lou, then then Patrick absolutely has to be uh, suspect number one. Absolutely. There, you know, so that, if that's the case, then the confusion over what was supposed to be going on on Thanksgiving makes more sense to me. The confusion makes more sense. Shelly says, my personal opinion is that Patrick did something. Um, Shaney says that where the phone ping, there's nothing but a grocery store, some gas stations, and schools. Carrie says, if I were a betting girl, I would lay money. It was at least connected to him in child custody of the baby. And <laughs> Cherie says, gentle souls are often, gentle souls are often guilty. How true, Cherie. How true. So uh, I wanted to talk about that. Um, I wanted to talk about Kelsey. You know, the, of course, if it wasn't Patrick, who could it be? Did she run off? Was she having something like postpartum depression or something like that that we know happens? That we know that uh, there are women who have children and then uh, go into a depression and never recover. That's very common. Some women come out of it, some don't. Could that have played a factor in all of this? Maybe. Um, Michelle says, the missing report being filed should have been on the fiance to file because the mother lived out of state and did not know she was missing. Is that correct? Michelle, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know. It's just unclear of what Ke uh, Kelsey's plans were for that day. You know, I think that that's the big thing that's up in the air, and I've never seen any reports about where she was supposed to be going that day or who, you know, who she was supposed to be with. And, you know, and we all know that when you have situations like that, it's no wonder that people go missing. When you don't know what their plans were supposed to be and people don't know where they were and where they're going and who they were going to be with. Those are the hardest kinds of missing persons cases to figure out. Shelly says, I heard something today about he and two men showing up at a local dump. The folks that worked there recognized Patrick and called the cops. Apparently, the fiancé stayed in the truck, and the other two men got out of the truck to throw stuff away. Supposedly, I don't know what to make of that, Shelly. I don't know. Lou said it was discussed that the father had custody of a child. Not sure of any of this. Not sure any of this is fact. Either am I. I've not seen anything like that once again. Not an expert on the case, but I've not seen that. Michelle says, I believe it was either her fiancé or someone from her work, being that she was a pilot, and her phone paying dinner 800 miles away kind of makes sense. Okay. Are you saying maybe she flew to Idaho? I guess that's possible, being that she's a flight, a pilot flight instructor. Shaney says, I'm just curious why her phone pings so far away and why did it take 10 days? I don't know either, Shaney. I don't know why it took 10 days. That seems a little outrageous, especially for a mother who has a child. Very unusual. Pinging. Okay. Well, she was a pilot. Her phone pinging 
800 miles away kind of makes sense. It could, Michelle. I don't know. Um, so I just wanted to update you on that, talk about that, just get your opinions on what is going on with her case, with Kelsey's case. And, um, you know, it's one of those situations like Jamie Kloss's that you wonder how long they are going to stay in the news before, you know, the information starts running out and you don't hear about it anymore just because there's no more leads. Um, is as well known as these cases are right now, if they don't get any new leads, I wouldn't be surprised if these two stories completely drop out of the news cycle very shortly. Very shortly. That's how that just how it works. Um, Katrina says, I thought I read she was last seen in a grocery store. Well, that was the last video of her, Katrina. That's true. But after that, she took her child uh, over to her boyfriend slash fiance's place, and it was his child too. Um, that uh, so she was seen on video, but um, that was then she went over to Patrick Frazee's house. All right, I want to talk about one more thing, and um, this is. Sarah says, keeping media attention is a huge struggle. Sarah, uh, you more than anybody know all about that. That's certainly true. I want to talk about making a murderer. I have not watched this show. Um, I don't have Netflix. I've heard about it. I've read a couple things about it. But I'm sure many of you know more about this program than I do. All right, so we're not necessarily going to be talking about uh, what went on on Making a Murder. Instead, uh, I'm wondering if all of you know that a cop mentioned the police department, and a particular cop, that, that uh, was mentioned during the filming of the, the show. One of the cops is now suing the show and Netflix. He is claiming that he was defamed during this. Um... The show, once again, I have not watched it. Just read a couple articles on this particular. Sheree says you haven't watched Making a Murder. Uh, Sheree, there's only so many hours in a day. I, I you know, I, If I get caught up watching all this true crime stuff, I'll never get any episodes done. I'll never get any reviews done. That's just the way it goes. That's just the way it goes. But my concern is about... Uh, how this show, the, the cop is saying that the show insinuated the cops planted evidence. And because of that, this cop has been defamed, his, his uh, character has been ruined, on and on and on. Um, uh, Kelly says, I don't want your Netflix login, please, please. I, 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 um, well, Cherie, I, I, he might be embarrassed. He might be embarrassed, but this is a real lawsuit now. I mean, this isn't, I, once again, I didn't watch it. I'm just telling you, this is a real lawsuit that is going on right now in which the show claimed the cops may have planted evidence, and now one of these cops is striking back, okay? I don't know if that, I don't know anything about this show. I don't know if the cops planted evidence. I don't know if the producers were just doing that to get better rate, you know, get, you know, more drama and sensationalism, which is certainly possible. But here's what I know. And you know that I try to, I have to walk a very fine line um, when I talk about cops. For example, the Thomas Brown episode where I personally discovered things that other people hadn't seen and maybe some you can draw some conclusions from what is on that video. Um, well, you know, I know some of you are saying, I see Emily and Sharia saying they absolutely did plan evidence. Well, the cop is saying they didn't. And he, I guess, he and others are willing to go to court to show that they didn't. And I have to tell you, this is fairly unusual. 
you know, um, if why would they bring a lawsuit that was only going to put them under a more powerful microscope? Why would they do that? I want you to I want you to think about that. I'm not here to argue with anybody, but why would they do that? I know that's what the episode, but here's something I'm going to tell all of you that you're not going to like. Okay? And I know you need to watch Making a Murder. You need to watch I'm just telling you. You don't know how much these shows manipulate you the viewer. Okay? I would not be so sure that you know you, you think you know as much as you do. These shows are not produced as um facts just following facts. These are ass essentially reality shows. Okay? I think that anybody you know has talked to me personally. I know some of you have talked to me personally. My opinion on a lot of these shows is very, very low. Okay? They are spectacular from an entertainment standpoint. They are horrible from an actual factual point of view because they rely on ratings. They need ratings or they don't and or they don't exist. And I worked in entertainment. I worked in it for like 10 years in Las Vegas. I worked on TV shows. I worked on movies. I've seen what goes on behind the scenes. And none of those people have any concern about lying to any of you. I want you to know that. Okay. Um, Uh, Stephanie says, if you watched it, I realize if I watched it, I would understand. But you have to understand something. Just because they filmed it that way doesn't make it true. All right? It doesn't make it true. Um, and once again, I'm not trying to defend the cops. What I know is if I did something wrong, if I did something that was underhanded to, to try to get somebody convicted, and then some show, and if I knew that I did it, I knew it. I planted a gun. I planted DNA. Whatever. I, you know, I faked a signature. I forced some witness to say something that wasn't true. And then a program out there said that I did. Why would I bring more scrutiny on myself by bringing a lawsuit? Why would I do that? Because more than likely, whatever that the lawsuit is going to happen is probably only going to make me look more guilty if that's the case, right? So, I, I, I but so there's that, and I, I once again I know that that's what they did on the show. I am so cynical about these shows. You, you don't, I, I don't think that maybe, you know, because I don't, I don't like to trash other shows. I don't bring them up. Um, I don't have time to listen to them. I catch once in them. But I know how important viewers are. I know how important listeners are. I know how important clicks are. And sometimes they will portray things in certain ways to up the sensationalism. Okay, I just want you to keep that in mind. Never take anything that you see on any of those programs. This is why I don't, this is the why when it comes to Unfound, I don't do things like everyone else does them. There's a reason. Because I want you to know that you aren't getting the information from me, just some third party, okay? you are getting the information from the people who have experienced themselves. Now, you are allowed to doubt them, okay? And I would I want you to, um, you know, trust but verify anything that any of my guests have ever said, okay? But I want you all to know that I am not personally manipulating you, okay? That's very important to me. I want you to know that I'm going out, I'm finding people who are close to the person, I talk to them, 
I check what they're saying, they come on, I ask them tough questions, and then you get to make the decision for yourself. That is not what goes on in most other true crime TV shows, podcasts, YouTube programs, nothing. Okay? That is not what goes on. It's not. Those programs are not based on solving cases. Those programs are based on getting more viewers, more clicks, more shares, more subscribers, etc. That's why they do it that way, because you know what? Sensationalism gets more listeners, more subscribers, more shares, etc. That's just the way it is. Okay? It, and I once again, I um I just I just um would not be I would not be so sure of what you think about these things that are done by these types of programs. You have to remember something. The people who produce these programs are not interested in truth. They're not interested in facts. They're interested in making sure that the show gets high enough ratings that they can do a whole never season, another season next year. That's the number one concern. That's the second concern, the third concern, the fourth concern, the fifth concern. And way down here about concern 100 is whether they're telling you the truth or not. I don't know how else to tell you that. All right, this is why I've said from day one when it comes to Unfound, my concern is solving cases. All right, that's why I don't get caught up whether Unfound is in the top 200 on iTunes. That's why I don't get caught up in all these other things that other hosts seem to get caught up on, on reviews and everything else. I don't read my reviews. I don't read them. I don't know where my rankings are. I don't know. I don't care. I judge it on how much we move cases forward. The only way you can move cases forward is by telling the truth. All right. There's a reason that all these Netflix shows and everything else have all these listeners and, and viewers and everything, and they rarely move anything forward. Um. You know, since, so, I just, I think, you know, it's hard for me to explain. I think that maybe this is just a disconnect between myself being a host and then listeners. And I try to bring you behind the curtain as much as I can. I love it. That's why I do this. Okay, that's why I do this. That's why I do these shows. That's why I'm one of the few people in true crime who does these tr these kind of these live show, interacting with all of you, talking, etc. But I'm telling you that what you are watching, the producers who put these shows together, their main concern is different than your main concern. You want these cases solved. You want this killer to go to jail. You want this person. And you're all awesome for thinking that way. The producers of these shows don't care. All right, I don't know how else to put it to you. They don't care. That's what I think I learned about being in entertainment for 10 years. I know you enjoy these programs, but they are not geared towards solving cases. They are geared toward getting people to talk. It's no different than kind of a little bit like National Enquirer stuff. So, um, I just have, you know, so when it comes back to this, um, and, and, you know, and I thought about this during the Jody Husentrut uh, episode as well, you know, on, the, on 48 Hours. The way they went after John Van Sice in that... Uh, um, 48 hours, um, very close to the line for me. And you know I love mentioning suspects and everything on the program. But I would like to think that when we do that, we always stay, you know what, um, we try to give up other possibilities. I try to cover other possibilities. And also I always try to remind everybody to this day, no charges have ever been brought against this person in regards to this disappearance. We always say that. Um, 
Whereas I watched that 48 Hours episode and I love that they covered Jody's case. But John Van Sice could possibly have a pretty, pretty good defamation case himself if he wanted to. That's a fact. Okay. You know, I think the advantage I've had sometimes is because some of the suspects we bring up already have a long criminal record. They're already known as felons, and it's not like we can defame them uh, even, uh, even more than they've defamed themselves. And my concern has always been, and any guest, uh, uh, Sarah Turney's in here, Stormy Dorsey's in here, Joyce Rivetuzzo's in here, you can ask any of them. My main concern is always we need to tell the truth. As long as we tell the truth, we have nothing to worry about. And so when I see a cop in this making a murder thing claiming that the producers and everything lied and they didn't do this, and he's willing to go to court to this, and he's willing to testify under oath, and other cops are willing to testify under oath that they didn't plant evidence, et cetera, that, pause, that cause gives me pause to think about that there might have been some manipulation of the viewers going on. And if that is the case, it's wrong. It's wrong. And so, so I just have, um, you know, once again, I think that this is just something maybe as a host that I look about it uh, very differently. And you know that I never mention any other shows as far as doing what I think is a crappy job and everything else, I don't do that. And in fact, I try to keep my mind on my own work. But when I run across a, uh, an article like this, I do think about the way other, I think other people go about their business and then I think about the way I go about my business. And as you know, um, I'm more than willing to give any suspect equal time on the program. To talk to them if they think that they've been defamed or we lied or they want to tell their side of the story like ha recently happened with scotty hughes i'm willing to do that i'm willing to do that but i'm just not so sure the average true crime enthusiast listener viewer realizes how men how much they get manipulated by some hosts and some programs on netflix and elsewhere that's my standpoint, and I, I'm going to stick to that probably forever. So there you go. Um, let's get to this week's, uh, this Friday's disappearance. This, the disappearance of Ashley Summers. And the title of this episode is called Gone on the Fourth of July. And this is a case that was covered on Disappeared early. You know, speaking of which, Disappeared is probably a perfect example. Look how many of you respect that program, and I get it. But I think that what Unfound has shown over the last two years is how much disappeared gets wrong, either through laziness, uh, a lack of investigative skills, um, because they only have 43 minutes to tell the story, et cetera. Look how much we've shown on the cases that we've covered. Um, of course, April Pitzer is the number one, the one that comes to mind, first of all. Just to show how Unfound has shown how disappeared gets so many things wrong. I'm telling you that happens on a lot of the other shows that you like. I'm telling you. So this was an episode that disappeared did earlier this year. Ashley Summers, she disappeared from Cleveland, Ohio on the 4th of July in 2007. The interview for this episode is going to be with Linda Summers, who was also interviewed during the Disappeared episode. And she is, if you can understand this, Ashley Summers' ex-grandmother. Ex she at one time was married to Ashley's grandfather, John, and they've since gotten divorced. But she, uh, Linda, is known as being a very good source of information on this disappearance. Like I said, she was um, interviewed for Disappeared, She's done other articles in Cleveland, and she has uh, the full support of Ashley's mother to talk to the media about Ashley's disappearance. 
Now, the interesting thing is that I started talking to Linda way back late September, early October, and then we decided to kind of put the interview off for a variety of reasons. But then there has been new information within the last month that has brought Ashley's disappearance back to the forefront in the Cleveland area. This is information that was unknown at the time that the disappeared episode was filmed. And it's, it's very important. And it has to do with the person who last, last allegedly saw Ashley. Very big news that we're uh, going to be talking about. She um, disappeared on the 4th of July. She allegedly got into a fight with her uncle about something that she was doing on her phone, and she stormed off never to be seen again. And the episode is called Gone on the 4th of July. And uh, if you've seen the disappeared episode, I'm telling you that we're going to be covering uh, a lot more information because what we've been able to, you're going to be amazed, once again, getting back to making a murderer, and other disappeared episodes, you're going to be amazed on how much information you will find if you watch the disappeared episode between now and Friday. If you watch it, you're going to find out that some of the things that they said in that episode are not true. And in fact, a lot of the information that came out in the disappeared episode might be completely fabricated out of thin air. Be up to you to, to, to make a decision on that. And once you listen to my inter interview with Linda, you'll understand what I'm talking about. But that is Friday's episode, The Disappearance of Ashley Summers. Gone on the 4th of July. She disappeared July 4th, 2007 from Cleveland, Ohio. The interview is her ex-grandmother, um, Linda Summers. So we've been going for about, um, what, 10 minutes and 12 seconds. Um, and there you go. So we've, um, let me read. I know a lot of you were talking about making a murder and some of you, of course, don't agree with what I'm saying. Totally fine. Um, Emily says I'm a correctional officer and I've heard other officers make comments like it's my word against theirs. I have had an officer try to get me to lie just because someone is supposed to be an upstanding citizen based on their job description. It doesn't mean they are. That's true. Uh, Sarah. Uh, Sarah Turney, sister of Alyssa Turney, I say the media cares a lot more about sensationalizing the story than actually helping them. I agree. Um, Alexa says, I completely with everything you're saying about making a murder. I was thinking the same thing when I watched it. I really wanted an unbiased look into the case and was so disappointed. Thank you, Alexis. Um, that I can agree on, which is why it's viewers' responsibility to do their due diligence to research as well. I agree, agree. Emily says, I think the main problem with shows like Disappeared is they only have a certain amount of time to cover a case, so they leave out information. My thing is, they can't cover all the information, they not cover the case at all. I think there's a good argument there, Amy, Emily. Um, and Alexa says, Disappeared is what got me into missing persons cases. I've also heard how many mis mistakes on other missing persons podcasts. It gets the word out and gets exposures for those missing, so I will still support Disappeared. Um, Alexis, I agree with you. They, disappeared has helped, no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. But they've been doing that program for about seven years now. They've covered quite a few cases, and they continue to make the same kind of mistakes over and over. And when mistakes are made in cases, it doesn't help. It only hurts. And it just doesn't seem to me that they're trying to get things right. So, so there you go. I've been talking for a while now. So what did we talk about? Uh, we talked about moving to YouTube. We, I asked you if you got all your Christmas shopping done. Uh, we talked about the poll for St Stephen Adams. Uh, we talked about how I've recently just posted the map for the Stephen episode, Adam episode, so maybe some of you can better understand the terrain there and what direction he was going the day he disappeared. We talked about the Jody Who's in Truth 48 Hours episode. We talked about Jamie Kloss. We talked about Kelsey Bereth and her disappearance. And then controversially, I guess, we talked about, I talked about how a cop is suing making a murderer claim that he and his fellow officers were defamed by uh, the show saying that the show saying that they planted evidence and my attitude is that 
Um, it wouldn't surprise me at all that the producers did that on purpose just to generate sensationalism. I, I can easily believe that. Okay, easily. It's not even a question. And that the cops are willing to go to court to prove that they didn't tells me something. And then finally, we talked about the disappearance of Ashley Summers. That will be Friday's case. And there will also be an episode next Friday. I'm going to do the interview tomorrow. Um, so we're going to have an episode right after Christmas as well. So be looking for that. Thank you all for joining in tonight. Um, Karen, thank you. Uh, thank you. It's an interesting live show. I deeply appreciate it. Uh, Cherie says, great show, except making a murder. Sorry, Cherie. I got to tell it like I see it. Uh, but I'm going to leave you tonight. You will hear me on Friday. The disappearance of Ashley Summers gone on the 4th of July. And um, I guess when we talk to you next, it'll be after Christmas. I hope you get all sorts of cool stuff. Good night, and I hope you have a great time with your families. Good night.